Uh, well, good morning. Thanks for um, uh, coming uh, again uh, early in the morning. Um, I just want to say I have no um, disclosures to make. And I figured I'd start with this, which is a picture of my brain um, captured on a fMRI machine. It's a nice looking skull, right? Uh, <laughs> and um, the reason I start there is just uh, by way of introduction. This is my brain. This is me. And I'll say a few words about what I do and, and then um, give the talk. So I teach at University of Minnesota Law School. The courses I teach are criminal law and evidence, uh, law and neuroscience, law and artificial intelligence. Uh, I've got a, a seminar on sports concussion in the law and student speech and uh, introduction to American law. Um, I direct a, a lab there uh, called the Neurolaw Lab. Uh, our motto is every story is a brain story, uh, which I think is true, but um, you know, one of the themes today is every story is a poorly understood brain story at present, and that causes some real challenges for, for law. So what do we do in the lab? Uh, the primary thing we do is empirical work, um, and I want to just thank all my, my various lab members the um, uh, last couple of years who, who contributed a lot. Uh, but we also are a little unique. We do um, education outreach work and some a policy work. So I spend a lot of time in front of judges and attorneys uh, introducing neuroscience, um, you know, talking about axons and dendrites and cell bodies to, to judges in order to then talk about things like memory and decision making uh, and the like. And we do work with uh, local legislatures and policy. So that's what we do. Um, a couple of other affiliations to mention and places to go for more on, on neural law. One is um, at Harvard, where I'm a fellow right now, uh, Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior. Um, we're leading a project on dementia, but they have projects on pain and juvenile justice and criminal law um, and a lot of other neat stuff. Um, I also uh, am affiliated. I teach down uh, as a professor, a visiting professor of neuroscience at Virginia Tech. Uh, the School of Neuroscience. Um, they're, they're building a great project there. They started two years ago. They had 50 majors. Now they have 350, and they think they'll get to 800 or 900. There's a real surge in interest in the United States right now, it seems, in neuroscience at the undergraduate level. So I think there are cohorts coming up. And then um, the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on Law and Neuroscience at lawneuro.org is based at Vanderbilt Law School. Uh, and I've been affiliated with it um, since 2009 as a postdoc and a number of other positions. And I direct our education and outreach activities. So uh, again, spend a lot of time with, with judges. So another great place to go. And it has a searchable bibliography um, that's, that's updated. So uh, you know, my um, thought today is that I'd uh, reflect or we could talk about uh, the future of neural law. Um, and uh, I'm a, you know, an empiricist, so I like to think about it in terms of data. And so I thought it's useful to think about it um, with this graph. So this is a graph of the uh, number of publications in law and neuroscience um, from uh, 1984 to 2014. And the thing to note is just that there's been this really uh, big uptick in, in growth over the last um, you know, five, 10 uh, years. And many of you have contributed to, the, to this growth. So um, in projecting forward, you know, I've come out here about 50 years, it seems to me there are, you know, there are infinite, of course, an infinite number of paths. But um, you know, we could think about them in terms of three. So one is, um, you know, if, if the talk I give today and, and the talk that the rest of us give today are so bad, everyone leaves and says, we're never going to do anything in neural law again. It would just flatline, completely flatline. Um, I don't think that will happen. Um, but what is, I think, potential is that, like most kind of fields, just kind of goes. And you know, some people do it, and it's a little niche industry. And it's like, oh yeah, law and neuroscience. That's what the, the little group does. Um, but I also think it's possible that there's really continued exponential growth. And I would label this kind of neuroscience and law 1.0, just continuing to do the same thing, or um, trying to figure out whether there's some way to, to really um, uh, uh, make some foundational changes in, in law, uh, practice, and doctrine. And so I'll reflect on that this morning. Um, in my mind, defining neural law is pretty easy. Um, justifying it is much more difficult. Uh, this is my shorthand definition, simply the, the legal use and governance of uh, neuroscientific tools and concepts and data. Um, so I think it's easy to define, but I think it's much more difficult to, to justify. You know, why neural law? Um, I come at this um, from a, a legal realist perspective at the turn of the last century, and I'd be interested to hear the European analogs. In the United States, um, we were heavily influenced by Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who wrote a, a book called The Path of Law. And in this book, um, Holmes uh, famously said that the black letter law man, so the person who focuses just on the law, 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 is the man of the 19th century. But the man of the 20th century would be the master of statistics and economics. And his argument was that we ought to figure out how the world works 
and then we ought to change law accordingly. And he has a wonderful quote. He says, um, it is revolting to have no better reason for a rule of law than it was so laid down at the time of Henry IV, right? That we simply do today because it's what we did yesterday. And he says, it is even more revolting if the grounds upon which that old law was laid down have vanished long since. And I, I think um, that is the opportunity for neuroscience and broadly a bunch of other disciplines too. Um, over the course of the 20th century, um, if we ask was Holmes right, I think the answer is absolutely yes. Um, today it's recognized, at least in the United States, and I, I think internationally, that law and economics um, is at least one of, if not the single most influential school. Um, many uh, faculties, including ours at University of Minnesota Law School, have PhD economists on our faculty, multiple PhD economists on our faculty. Indeed, some who are purely PhD economists without even a, a JD or formal legal training because law has realized it's tremendously important to understand how markets work and, and how individuals decide. So here's my prediction. Um, in 2017, um, I think that perhaps neuroscience and law over a long period of time may become one of um, uh, the most influential schools. And am I right? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> uh, but I, I do think so. Um, and the rest of the talk is, is aimed to try and convince you as to why I think that's the case. So I've kind of organized a sort of a quick look um, in the past, because I do think it's important just to remember where we've come from, um, some current trends, and then most of the time on the, on the future. Um, looking back, uh, and I want to thank Professor Denno for allowing me to um, produce in uh, her um, symposium at, at Fordham University and Fordham Law Review a piece on the overlooked history of neural law. I actually brought it. I had a couple copies. I was like, leaving. So if anybody wants one, I, I've got one. Uh, I won't go through all of this. I just want to make the point that there actually is a long history here uh, of engagement with, with neuroscience. It was called something different. Um, it wasn't called formally neuroscience 100 years ago or below before, um, but there was intersection. And I'll just give one example. Um, some of you may know uh, Adrian Raines' uh, book, The Anatomy of Violence from 2013, where he compared um, the uh, neurobiology of those who murder uh, in his sample versus, and, and PET scans uh, versus the neurobiology of controlled sample um, comparison. Um, but you may not know that 40 years earlier, there was a book called Violence in the Brain. I, I'm interested to, to know, usually not many people know about this, but maybe it's different here. Does, is anybody familiar with the work of Vernon, Mark, and Frank Irvin in this room? No? Okay, well then I'm glad we're having this, this conversation. So, um, uh, it, it, there was actually, um, th there were some European uh, connections as well. Um, there's a, a professor named Delgado at Yale who was doing um, uh, mind control uh, via um, electrical stimulation, uh, uh, remote electrical stimulation. The idea of both was that they wanted to understand the way that the interpersonal violence in the human brain originates because the goal of both is ultimately to intervene and to solve and to make the world a more peaceful and just place. Um, Forty years ago in the United States, this made a lot of headlines. Their work. They were both at Harvard. They were very, you know, they were legitimate researchers, MD and, and um, PhD, and they made the, the popular headlines. It, here, scientists studying over-aggressive behavior are now implicating brain damage from hitherto hidden sources, new clues to the causes of violence. I just, this is 1973. 40 years ago. It sounds like a headline that could come from today. Um, uh, what they did, they worked at MGH Hospital, Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, and they worked on patients who were coming in for seizure disorders. These patients were having surgery and having electrodes implanted in their brain for the seizure disorder, but they were allowed to do research. Um, and this is their most famous patient, um, Julia. Figure four, Julia in a pleasant mood before deep brain stimulation. They focused primarily on the amygdala. They'd use this technology, it's a, um, a remote control stimulation. They press a button and then see what happens. Julia, after deep brain stimulation of the amygdala, rage behavior attacking wall suddenly and unexpectedly. They couldn't do research like this anymore. I think that's a good thing because of the Institutional Review Board and Human Subject Protections in the United States. Um, it's sort of a, an alarming image, but their motivation was justified uh, on the grounds that we have this intractable problem. We don't know why people are violent with one another. We think it originates in the brain, and if we could find that violent center, their idea was we could cut it out. They performed psychosurgery. Now, the reason that it's not cited uh, in Adrian Rain's book, I asked him, he said, because I never read it. Um, it completely fell out of the literature. It fell out of disfavor. I think it's in part because um, their methods weren't nearly as good as they thought they were. Indeed, there was a large malpractice suit from one of their patients. I think it's also because this was happening at the rise of um, pharmacology coming online. It's a lot simpler to throw a lot of pills into someone rather than to 
cart them in for surgery. But the, my point is that we did try something like this on the very same justification uh, uh, not so long ago. And even before that, 40 years before, I'll just flag, here is uh, your pin that I presume you do know, Igas Moniz and his invention of this little device for the prefrontal lobotomy. What you may not know is that this also um, drew the attention um, of a number in, in law. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the Yale Law Review, um, I'll give you a quote, um, after the Nobel Prize was awarded, uh, or was just about to be awarded in 1948, said this about psychosurgery. Psychosurgery has startling implications for rehabilitation, and it is proving successful in an increasing number of cases. Perfection of so relatively simple and inexpensive a rehabilitative technique as the prefrontal lobotomy promises to be a major contribution to the cure of criminals. Right? Um, and of course, and, uh, we now know that retrospectively, um, looking back, uh, this was not anywhere near uh, a cure for criminals. Thankfully, it was never had widespread use in the United States. In fact, I'm not sure it was ever used um, uh, on a, in a formal criminal uh, uh, context, but the law was very interested. And why not? Because we, again, we have an intractable problem, interpersonal violence. Here's a body of knowledge that says we have some tools, some new tools to help you, law. Law says, well, we don't know, are you, is it ready? Well, how, what, what are your, your bona fides? How do we know? And they come back and say, well, how about a Nobel Prize? Is that good enough for you? Um, right? So it, it's very difficult to know when a particular body of knowledge, a particular tool, including neuroscience, is ready for use in, in law. And I, I just mention all this not to um, be pessimistic. Indeed, I'm very optimistic about where neuroscience and law is going. But I, I think we ought to be also very humble about how complicated the brain is and therefore how, complica and the, how complicated the, the cognitive um, mechanisms that we care about in law are, and therefore um, we need to proceed cautiously. But that's all I'll say about the past. There is a lot more to say. It's, it's, there's, a, there's a wonderful past to our, our field. Um, what's happening right now? Well, lots of things are happening. Here's a whirlwind tour. Um, brain science is everywhere, including the courts, and um, you heard about that yesterday from Professor Denno, and I would just echo and emphasize what she says. Um, uh, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of cases that are contemplating neuroscience now. So it's not a maybe someday this will happen, at least in some context this is already happening a lot. Uh, it's showing up in legal scholarship. I showed you that graph before. Um, it's showing up in legislatures as well. Um, we published a piece uh, a little over a year ago on, on neural legislation and tracked empirically, sort of the same thing Professor Deno did, except we looked at um, bills that are proposed in U.S. state legislatures, and you see kind of a similar trend. Um, just you know, an up, uptick in the types of, of things that are mentioned, things like Alzheimer's and mental health and juvenile justice, sports concussions, you know, things that, are, that constituents want to hear about. Um, I will point out that our, my conclusion from the, the empirical analysis was that neuroscience tends to reinforce rather than um, revolutionize uh, legislators' pre-existing normative commitments. That is, here's the policy that you like. If neuroscience seems to be in keeping with that policy, you like neuroscience. If you like that policy, you don't like neuroscience and vice versa. Which isn't to be, um, I, in some ways isn't surprising, but is a useful reminder that in the policy sphere, neuroscience is almost automatically politicized, like many other types of science. Um, and I think that's, that's a challenge we ought to be aware of. Um, brain science is showing up in, in law classrooms, and um, we were talking about your course uh, last night, and there are a growing number of courses. Um, I'll just mention that the field is moving really quickly. We have a case book, and I only mention it because um, almost 90% of the material in our book is published just since 2000, which is when I graduated college. So if I, you know, had been, I didn't know anything about law and neuroscience as I graduated from college, I think because not a lot of it was out there. 60% um, just from 2018, and indeed a lot of the stuff since 2014 has happened, a lot of this happens in 2014, and in some ways the book we're working on the second edition is already outdated. Just things are moving very, very um, quickly. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of this, but I, I do think that um, there are many, many potential intersections of neuroscience and law. Uh, criminal law appropriately draws a lot of attention, but um, I, just, I just think um, there are many, many areas, and I, and I do think that internationally there's a, a real deficit right now uh, of comparative work, and so it's been fun to, to learn about um, what's happening here in some of the civil systems. Uh, okay, so let me just um, uh, offer a few more words as to why I think there's so many intersections. It's, you know, kind of um, straightforward to say, but it's because the brain is just implicated in a lot of this. 
this work. Um, and I think we can conceptualize this uh, in three different ways. So, so one has to do with regulation. Um, this is the, the governance of neuroscience, both in the courtroom, what do you allow in the courtroom, and broadly, what do you allow in society? And I'll give you some examples. Um, I think we can think about tools. Do we have a new neuroscientific tool that might help us do our job in law and policy? Um, and I think we can think about um, conceptually, um, and, and I know that there's a lot of great work going on in uh, some of your, your uh, scholarship on, um, on this. You know, how do we re-envision doctrine and, and concept given what we've learned from neuroscience? So let me just quickly give an example of, of all three and um, from the areas of dementia. I'll just mention them. It's one of the things we're working on. Um, so you could think about what are the legal implications of a, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. You know, do you immediately have revocation, remove a driver's license? Well, what do you do at a policy level? You could think about um, tools. Are there new neuroscientific tools that might help the law determine a dementia patient um, capacity or, or competency or, or the undue influence on them? Um, and then conceptually, um, you know, and this is a theme in a lot of our work that I'm going to talk about, how do you take probabilistic scientific data uh, gathered from, from the brain, so things that we can't directly see and things that an individual can't even self-report, what do you do with that and what do you do with that for the categories that law, law has? Um, we recently did a, a program just uh, last, I guess about 10 days ago actually, on dementia and democracy, uh, you know, aging judges and politicians. And I was asking some of you if you have mandatory retirement ages. Uh, we do not in the federal system in the United States um, and raises lots of questions. Uh, as well. So I also spend most of the time uh, now, it's kind of a run up just to get to the good stuff on, on the future. Um, I, I want to start with this headline, which came from um, the New York Times Magazine, Neurolaw, the trials of Neurolaw, um, how advances in brain science could transform our legal system. But um, this was uh, 2007. So it's been really a, a decade since we we're on the cover of New York Times Magazine, which was great. Um, but you know, sort of what's, what's happened? Um, you know, Neurolaw, there are more conferences, there's more interest, um, but it's not as if it's quickly reshaped the legal system. In fact, I don't know, uh, well, I mean, I'll give you a few examples, but kind of wh where do we go next? And, and I reflected that in a, on a piece, uh, Law and Neuroscience 2.0. I also brought a couple copies of it in case anyone uh, wants it, but um, this is, this is uh, the question. I think there are twin competing um, uh, uh, feelings that I have. On one side, there's tremendous excitement. And the excitement is driven by, the, um, by where the science is going. So one thing to recognize is that it's not just neuroscience that's developing rapidly, but a host of related fields. Um, artificial intelligence, brain-machine interface, you know, computer science, virtual reality, nanoscience, robotics. These things are, are happening very quickly. Gene editing. Um, this stuff is happening. There's more investment in neuroscience. This is a graph of just the number of people on the left axis studying neuroscience, the members of Society of Neuroscience. This only goes to 2012 and the amount of of money invested in, in research. So there's lots and lots and stuff. Um, and just as a predictive proposition, it seems impossible to me that with 50,000 people waking up every morning and studying the brain, and with millions upon millions of dollars being invested globally, that we won't learn a substantial more about the brain in the coming years. I and mean, I think that's a pretty non-controversial um, point. So there's the excitement. But there's a tension and there's a lot of caution. And I think um, we can look at the state of the clinical science in psychiatry and psychology to understand the caution. So Steve Hyman, who is the former uh, director of the National Institute of Mental Health in the United States and former provost of Harvard, and a big deal, um, asked uh, about 10 years ago, a little under le less, can neuroscience be integrated into the DSM-5 or the equivalent, the international, the ICD? And, and the answer is very clearly not yet. So almost all mental disorders um, are still diagnosed via symptoms. Right? We rely on what can you self-report to us via our nice battery of organized questioning, and what can we observe about you, again, using a, a certain well-researched um, instrument. Um, we do not diagnose mental disorders. We don't even classify mental disorders the way we do many other types of medicine. So if I have a broken femur, I determine whether my femur is broken via a scan, and it doesn't matter if I tell you I don't think I have a broken femur. If I, we see the, the, uh, the, the, the bone is broken, I have a broken femur. Similarly, uh, in cancer, you know, my brother's a cancer a doctor, or academic researcher, and I've asked him before, you know, John, have you ever once gone to a patient and offered a diagnosis based on something other than, you know, cell data, you know, blood test, or you know, typically a biopsy of cells? Well, no, of course not, right? 
Symptoms are useful to inform clinical care, but they're not determinative of uh, the disorder. And what's happening on the research side of mental disorders is that many, many thousands of folks uh, are waking up every morning, whether it's animal models or human models, and trying to look at the brain basis for these things. And I think that will change, but not yet. Uh, and so I, I think intellectual modesty in order is, is in order, um, quoting Greg Miller, a wonderful psychologist. Um, uh, right now, neuroscience is really limited uh, in informing clinical care, and therefore might be limited for the present in informing law. But um, there, I think, is a lot of reason to be um, uh, hopeful. And there is a lot of reason, actually, for our community, the ethicists, the scholars, the, pra the, the law practitioners, to be involved precisely because there is this mismatch between, present mismatch between what clinicians need or what the law needs and what science can provide. That is, neuroscience offers something, but not something dispositive. And so what do we do to fill in, fill in the gap? So, and regulation, I think, is a big deal. So the, the, the big question to me is, um, you know, what, what are our criteria, our general criteria by which we promote or criticize or restrict or embrace neuroscience in the public sphere? And I'll give you an example. Um, this, I'm going to play a 30-second advertisement that runs in the United States, um, and it's pretty self-explanatory. It's from a group called Lumosity, who makes um, little brain training games, is what they describe them as. So here's the, the I ad. I can tell a big difference. Decisions come quicker and more productive. It's serious brain training. It just feels like games. Well, Lumosity.com is based on neuroscience, so I figured if I want to get smart, I have to start smart, you know? No matter why you want a better brain, Lumosity.com can help. It's like a personal trainer for your brain, improving your performance with the science of neuroplasticity, but in a way that just feels like games. Start training with Lumosity.com right now and discover what your brain can do. Right. Um, they didn't have to mention brain. They could have just said mind. Um, they didn't have to say the science of neuroplasticity, but they did. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there in the public sphere that's emphasizing brain, brain, brain. I mention this because on the regulatory sphere, this became a neuro law question when our Federal Trade Commission slapped an enormous multi-million dollar fine on that group, not for that ad in particular, but for a suite of things that they were doing that weren't backed up by the science. And currently, there's an academic debate about the extent to which playing a little game just makes you better at playing the game or does, in fact, enhance some cognitive function. Um, on the idea of cognition, um, there are also questions about regulating cognitive enhancement. Of course, we all enhance ourselves. We try to go to, we mandate schooling. Right now, we're enhancing. Um, but there are new modes of enhancing, as captured nicely by this cartoon, um, increased by drugs and by linking human brains directly to computers. And there's, there's the drugs. Um, and in the United States, uh, and indeed some worldwide, uh, where the drugs are available, um, students are, for instance, uh, taking some. Uh, taking uh, Adderall, Ritalin, other sorts of uh, drugs, not to uh, return to normal, however we define normal, very complicated, but to go from normal to something above. Um, and is that any different from getting better sleep and studying harder and doing all the other things that by the, manipulate the brain to improve cognitive enhancement? Um, these are questions that, um, that you know, are, involve this regulation. You know, uh, let's get to regulation in the courtroom, which is where we may perhaps most relevant for today. There are versions, a lot of these, did my neurons make me do it? My brain tumor made me do it. Um, it's even showing up, uh, you've heard about some of the courtroom, even showing up in plea bargaining. So in the United States, um, 85, 90, in some cases, higher percent of cases don't go before a jury, even a judge. They're worked out between a, a prosecutor and the defense attorney. And they say, what do you think? Oh, okay, and they come to a deal, probably pretty quickly. What if neuroscience started to be part of that conversation? Um, well, it's starting to, uh, but there's only one so far that I know. We know Attorney Cobb, so on uh, the interest of disclosure, he's um, someone I've talked to. I, I, I don't, I'm going to be a little critical uh, in some sense, but, um, and also defend his, his position. Uh, and I'll just let you see what he says about how he uses neuroscience in plea bargaining. Most cases settle. That's the truth. So how do we handle that? Well, one of the things that is most innovative about our law firm is we're the first law firm in the United States, if not the world, to use neuroimaging for damage control in criminal cases. What do I mean? Well, take a look at the pictures on the screen right now. Those are pictures of a healthy, normal range brain image. It's a very problematic and photo. When you see the next set of <laughs> images, this set of images right here, you can see these are completely different. 
They are very a different. A lot of different <laughs> things can harm the brain, and we all know that human behavior is a direct result about everything we think and feel and how well the brain is working. When you or a family member finds yourself in legal trouble, not once, not twice, but over and over again, or in a relationship that's having significant problems leading to an arrest, or in whatever aspect of life, you have things that just aren't going right, and then boom, you or someone you love gets arrested. We know that every single time when the brain is imaged, there are going to be health problems. OK, every single time when the brain is imaged, there are going to be health problems. Um, if you go to the imager that he uses, who is a discredit, uh, discredited imager in the United States named uh, Dr. Amen, um, Daniel Amen, you probably will get um, these odd looking images, which are you know, completely problematic. But um, let me defend his position for a moment. He is not hired to be a neuroscientist. He is not hired by his client to do a review of the academic literature and write a review essay. He is hired to, in our adversarial system especially, to vigorously defend his client. And if he is getting, and what he'll go on to say is that he's gotten some better outcomes for his clients. Um, if he's able to get better outcomes for his clients, if he feels that what he's doing is ethical and moral, and he's not, he himself is not doctoring the images, I'm not suggesting that, he's going to experts who are providing him with these images. And the other side, of course, in the adversarial system is free to raise whatever critiques they want. Um, there's at least a case to be made um, that he's doing what, exactly what he's supposed to be doing. There's another case to be made just as an empiricist to say whether you like it or you don't like it, when he releases this video, which is public, and he has more press releases, and the cost of brain imaging comes down, other public defenders, other uh, defense lawyers might well say, I think I should do that too. Indeed, as other defendants hear about it, they might say, it, I, did, you, did you look into my uh, brain data for this plea bargain? Right? So I think this, this is possible to happen. Um, I just want to mention one other case, um, because it raises some questions that have come up. This is Herbert Weinstein, a uh, famous case from the uh, early 1990s in New York. He, threw, he uh, was an advertising executive, strangled his wife, threw her out of their 13-story New York apartment building to make it look like a suicide, and pled insanity. It was an interesting neural law case because these were the images he wanted to present to the jury. MRI and a PET scan showing a frontal lobe pressing in uh, an arachnoid cyst, uh, excuse me, an arachnoid cyst pressing in on his uh, frontal lobes. And his argument was that this caused him to be unable to appreciate the wrongfulness of his um, of his actions. And the, ju the judge had to decide whether or not to admit this. Uh, in the United States, we have this intense uh, uh, love of lay juries, and so there's a concern about how juries will handle this. Um, uh, so this, th these questions are, are showing up. In this particular case, um, they did uh, rule that the uh, imaging could be admissible, though with some restrictions on the cause and causation a testimony that could be, be offered. And interestingly, Weinstein then took a plea deal and his lawyer speculated, uh, not a great plea deal either, his lawyer wondered if indeed this had something to do with his acceptance of a plea deal, but we don't know. Th there's no body of research as became evident in the case tying this to any violent behavior. We don't know how many other people are walking around with similar brains who are not doing similar things, who, uh, and, and simply an, as an open question. Um, but it's showing up, you know, from last year, there was a, a mixed martial uh, arts fighter, this is the expert who testified, Kind of same idea, right? Frontal lobe lesion that could call it hypersexual and very aggressive behavior. Um, you heard yesterday about the, the Grady Nelson case, and I just wanted to add to it. I, I won't give you the details again. Uh, Professor Denno did, did an excellent job introducing this case. Uh, he was a death penalty case, um, and three of the jurors, as Professor Denno said, talked to the press afterwards, and here's what they said about this QEEG evidence that they, they heard. Um, quote, juror Dolores Cannon, hospital secretary, quote, when the brain evidence came in, the facts about the QEEG, some of us changed our mind. End quote. Juror John Howard, an airport worker, the QEEG evidence turned my decision all the way around. The technology really swayed me. After seeing the brain scans, I was convinced this guy had some sort of brain problem. End quote. Now, they didn't all buy it. Juror Leon Benbow, retired mailman, my favorite. <laughs> quote, all that scientific testimony, that was a waste of taxpayer money. That's phony. There's nothing wrong with that guy's brain. Uh, and, end quote. And I, um, I am on record as saying I, I didn't think it should be admitted. Um, but there it is. And it saved a man's life. Um, and again, um, in an adversarial system, in a system if you think especially that the odds are stacked against 
a defendant, that the system is rigged, um, what are our normative criteria by which we're going to say this was the right decision in the moral sense or the wrong decision to, to allow for the use of this evidence? I think that's a very difficult question. And that's a question for a group like this, for philosophers, for, for careful thinkers. Um, open question. I'll just mention one other because it's often um, of interest. There have been a couple of brain-based lie detection cases. Um, I'll mention EEG memory detection is something we work on in our lab. But the USV SEMRAO in 2010 in, in the state of Tennessee in the United States was our first case where fMRI lie detection was offered. Um, the question was whether this defendant knowingly defrauded the government um, via billing. And the idea is you send a certain billing code to the government and they reimburse you. Well, he was picking different billing codes that had a higher reimbursement. And he was doing it again and again. But he said, oh yes, I did that, but I didn't know I was doing it. It was a mistake. It was really complicated. I didn't understand. I'm sorry. Um, did he do it knowingly? Question of mens rea. And he went and found this expert, Steve Lakin, um, who put, uh, I could go through all the details, I won't, but put the defendant through multiple brain scans, um, ran a set of procedures, which I'm on record as being critical of, but came with this conclusion. I, Dr. Lakin, conclude that Dr. Semrau's brain indicates he is telling the truth in regards to not cheating or defrauding the government. And again, the question was whether or not a jury should be able to hear this. Um, there were multiple, uh, two experts, two of our colleagues in the MacArthur group who testified in the Daubert hearing, so the evidentiary hearing with before you get to the jury in the United States uh, procedurally. We have this hearing, the judge will decide, can the jury hear it? Um, the judge ruled no, um, but I'll just give you, again, uh, by um, virtue to try and channel my inner Dr. Lakin, who I've sat down with, and although I disagree, I can see his point. He says, we lost, we'll let in a lot of other shaky evidence. And this goes to weight, not admissibility. That is, you should give this to the jury. And Dr. Lakin says, I don't know whether uh, the defendant was telling the truth or not. I simply know that my data suggests probabilistically that it seems more likely than not that he is. And in a Bayesian updating model, you give this information to the jurors, they can weight it high, they can discredit it, there's cross-examination, so if you don't like my science, you can cross-examine me. You can call another expert to say all of these things uh, the pro that are problematic, but don't keep the information from the jury. Let them decide how to weight it. That would be his, his argument. I think there are good counter-arguments to it, but um, again, that's a question for a group like this to decide. How do you balance those competing interests? Um, one last thing to say about, uh, about the rise of evidence. This is um, data that, like Professor Denos, this is from Professor Farahani, Nita Farahani's work. You just see these similar, similar trends, right? More and more cases. But I want to point out um, one thing about all of this data that we're seeing, which is that the y-axis, the number of cases, is still very small relative to the denominator of all criminal cases. Or even if you, so this is 350. Even if we undercounted by a factor of 1,000, so there are 35,000 cases. That's a lot. But the denominator of all criminal cases in a given year in the United States is huge. And so it's not as if, even if it fully flourishes, neuroscience will be in every criminal case. As opposed to, say, some other technological innovations like a new electronic filing method, where, yes, every single case would use that new, new method. And so I've argued that um, the future of neuroscience and law may be a lot like in, uh, in athletics instant replay, um, when there is contested uh, idea that the referees, the umpires go and they look and they look back at the video to see and when do they do that? Not every play, in fact, 95, 99% of plays involve no instant replay. It would be arduous if every time they did this. They do it when the question is, was a point scored or not? High stakes. When like a foot is just on the line or the ball just misses the goal post. Very close. And critically, when you actually have the opportunity to do this, when you have the technology. And so I think that we're seeing a constellation of the ability to do this, and maybe on your close calls, whether in criminal or civil law, where you have the ability to do this, we'll see more. We'll see. Um, quickly, uh, let me just walk through some tools that we're investigating that I think are, that others are investigating that I think are, might be useful. Um, one is memory recognition. Um, uh, briefly, use EEG-based memory recognition. Uh, the idea is you put on the EEG cap and you can determine, uh, we've got a paper looking at uh, and reviewing some of the science on whether or not um, if you flash a bunch of images or other information in front, can you determine whether or not this is a novel stimuli 
or something that's been seen before? And could you use this to determine whether a particular defendant has seen something that only the perpetrator of the crime and the investigators have seen before? A lot of challenges to it. Um, it's not ready for use yet, uh, but we argue um, that uh, it's likely not to bias jurors too much. Um, and although the headline from our, our local student paper said about our, our study, Neuro Neurotech might be perfect evidence for courtrooms, that's not right. <laughs> it, it will never be perfect, but I think someday it might be evidence for courtrooms. It'll probably take us another decade, I think, to do all the studies we need to know that. Um, and it's an open question, but I, I think it has legitimate um, chance. Uh, there's a lot of work going on in pain detection. I won't mention it, um, except to say that my colleague Amanda Pastilnik at the University of Maryland, who were, were also fellows at this um, uh, Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior, is doing great work. Um, there are a lot of new tools to measure traumatic injury in, in sport. Uh, we're working on this. So we won't, we've got a, a big project. Um, but the big problem, which is showing up in a lot of places, is that we don't even know what a brain injury is. And I tell my students, we measure most brain injury without direct brain data. Most brain injury is determined based on neuropsychological testing. Again, on the two things that we can do. We can observe you. Are you dizzy? Do you want this? And we can get you to self-report or take a test. Um, and as a result, we have many different definitions of concussion. Um, and these are the things we use. We use symptoms. Headache, dizziness, ringing ears, fatigue, memory loss. Where the field is going is towards things such as blood tests and uh, EEG. And, you know, as my colleagues in Minnesota, they're working on eye tracking, right? Um, so this kind of stuff is happening. We've got a bunch of papers coming out. I won't mention them because um, I want to jump to biomarkers where I think uh, there, there is great uncertainty ahead. And I don't know what the law is going to do, but I think we have to think really carefully about probabilistic biomarkers of, of mental uh, uh, functioning that's legally relevant. And I'll give you some examples. I want to flag that this conversation is going on in conjunction with a lot of other disciplines. So in February, um, there's a group that's getting together, our Artificial Intelligence, Ethics, and Society, and, and um, Gary Marchant at Arizona State and others are organizing the, the law port on which I'm participating, um, thinking a lot about these, these issues. Um, and I think, for instance, here's just one example, what are the legal implications of early detection of elevated risk for Alzheimer's? So you take a 45, say 55-year-old uh, man or woman, um, you have them come in and take, you take brain imaging data and add some genetic data, and you come up with a profile risk. And it turns out that they're way up here, much more elevated likelihood of, of Alzheimer's. But at present, and excuse me, elevated risk based on changes in brain and blood. Okay. So there's something changing in them that suggests this. But they feel fine. On every battery of tests, they are fine. How should law handle that? Um, and we've tried to think carefully about it. Um, and just we have more questions than answers. Does insurance already cover that? Is that a disabled state? Can you discriminate on, the, on, on any of that information? How do you handle privacy? What would you do with that information? Um, there are already companies that are trying to do this. This company is now out of business. They were basically told to stop because here's what they told consumers. Our goal is to provide the comprehensive and definitive imaging services required for confirming the presence or absence of Alzheimer's disease at the earliest point possible. And again, in terms of regulation, we can't do this yet. And it's a problem to tell consumers that you can. And we could ask this for a lot of other um, disorders. Here's just one more example where, again, the ethical, the legal implications are unclear. What are the legal implications of elevated risk for autism spectrum disorder? I have colleagues on an international collaboration, uh, one at Minnesota, my, my colleague Jed Ellison. Here's the headline. Um, uh, researchers assist in identifying autism biomarkers in infancy. Um, right now, they're at 87% positive predictive value. They take a six-month-year-old toddler, just a little baby. They put this little baby with this special um, uh, uh, a setup in an MRI machine. They take that brain data. They run a whole bunch of support vector algorithms, and they can predict, again, with almost 90% accuracy, whether or not at two years old that baby will be on the autism spectrum disorder. They just got re-upped for another $5 million. They will replicate those findings. They anticipate being in the 90 to 95% predictive value. Their goal is clinical because there is some evidence to suggest that early and intensive intervention for autism can be effective. But again, they're taking data that no one else can see. They're running it through an algorithm that no one else can understand. And then they're telling parents and the legal system or the social services system maybe and clinicians Here's what we think perhaps you ought to do. You can imagine that raises deep legal, ethical, normative 
questions um, that, again, a group like this is well poised to think about. And that no one's really figured out yet. I, we're involved trying to help. To, it's, it's very complicated. And then finally, just some concepts um, that I'll throw out. Um, one, we haven't talked a lot about juvenile justice here, but it's worth noting that in the United States, this is probably the place where we've seen the most concrete set of changes based on neuroscience and law. Our Supreme Court now multiple times has cited to brain science in changing the way that the criminal system, uh, uh, restrictions on the criminal system's penalties for juveniles. So we can no longer, uh, in the United States, and you couldn't anyway in many countries, but we have still had a death penalty for juveniles. We no longer do. We no longer have life without the possibility of parole for non-homicide crimes. And we no longer have automatic life without the possibility of parole, even for homicide crimes. And the latter two cases both cited brain science as part of the explanation. We're seeing a, um, a lot of activity at the policy level based on neuroscience. So the, the, another place I think, um, I wish I had more time, I don't, um, I love mens rea and we've had a series of, of publications on mens rea. I'll just say that um, uh, to me it's been a great joy to work with a number of colleagues because we built the behavioral model first, we published the law stuff, and then we took it into the scanner with uh, Matt Ginther, who's JD, PhD, and other neuroscience colleagues, Renee Marois, um, to try and look at third party punishment. Um, what's going on in the minds of jurors when they assess the mental state of a defendant? The bottom line of our studies is that it's really hard for, um, defend, for uh, jurors to uh, distinguish between knowing and reckless behavior, um, and that um, there's an interesting set of, sort of underlying neurobiology and how they integrate harm and, um, uh, and mental state in assessing punishments. Finally, um, uh, my favorite case that I, I want to mention has to do with this situation, this happened in a state uh, in the United States um, uh, called Michigan. And um, the facts are pretty straightforward. This is not the actual picture, but it's, it's basically what happened. The school bus just very negligently, you know, down goes the crossing gate, stop, should stop, and the school bus swerves around and gets onto the railroad tracks. And the train is coming down and can't stop, and it hits the bus. And we're interested legally actually in the conductor of the train, whose name is Charles Allen. And Mr. Allen, you know, this experience, he rushes out. Thankfully, there are no kids on the bus. It was after the drop off. But there was a very badly injured bus driver. And fast forward, uh, Mr. Allen develops post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's pretty clear that he does have post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's pretty clear that the reason he has it is this very traumatic event. It's also very clear that there's no other quote unquote physical injury because he was a conductor in this enormous train. And when a train hits the bus, he doesn't have a scratch, right? He's just, but he does have this PTSD. And so the legal question was whether or not he could sue the government because there's an immunity statute. Um, most of our states have this. For policy reasons, we prevent you from suing the government for a variety of things, but there's an exception. Government agencies shall be liable for bodily injury resulting from negligent operation of these vehicles. And so the legal question was, is the PTSD that Mr. Allen experienced bodily injury? Right? Again, every quote unquote part of his body was fine other than his brain with this PTSD. They introduced neuroimaging. The uh, district court said, no, this is not bodily injury. Imagine the slippery slope because if this is bodily injury, every mental disorder would be bodily injury. Of course, that was just the point. The appellate court, however, said, wait a second. We see the logic. The brain is a part of the body. PTSD is physically instantiated in the brain. Therefore, yes, PTSD is a bodily injury. You can sue the government. And it went up to the, the state, not the US Supreme Court, but the state Supreme Court, and it settled, which means that we have no governing law on this particular question in that state. But questions like this are emerging. And again, that's a question for a group like this. What constitutes a bodily physical injury? And I think that. Um, this determinism, uh, excuse me, this uh, mind-body dualism issue is, is really um, a big one for the future conceptually. So, you know, the last thing I'll say in, in, in uh, you know, uh, passing at the end is just to offer a couple of quotes on the, on the future. Um, this is uh, one from Artificial Intelligence from Ray Kurzweil. And um, for those of you who followed the AI world, there was this thing called the AI winter, where there was this, everyone was super excited about artificial intelligence a few decades ago, and then not a lot happened. And, um, and many people commented on it, and this is what Kurzweil wrote. He said, the technology hype cycle for a paradigm shift typically starts with a period of unrealistic expectations based on a lack of understanding. While the widespread expectations for revolutionary change are accurate, they are incorrectly timed. 
when the prospects do not quickly pan out, a period of disillusionment sets in. Nevertheless, exponential growth continues unabated, and years later, a more mature and realistic transformation does take place. And I, I think that might be a nice prediction for what happened with neural law. You know, 10 years since the big magazine cover, most of our doctrine, with some exceptions, still looks the same. There are just these, lots of these little conferences. Um, but I think that over time, and it might take another century, it took a century to get law to care about economics, um, another century we may, we may really be on to something. And so I'll offer a, in closing this last quote from Bill Gates. He says that we often uh, overestimate how much change there will be in two years and often underestimate how much change there will be in 10, right? So we think something's going to happen really quick, and then it doesn't, but actually something will change. It just takes longer. And I, I think it might take more than 10, um, but, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, um, I think rooms like this will be much bigger. I think there'll be a lot more interest in neuroscience and law. I think neuroscience will give us a lot more tools, concepts, resources. Um, and if we do our job right, uh, I think we could really have transformation in the law. So that's my view of law and neuroscience 2.0. And uh, I think I saved a little time for, for questions. Yeah. Thank you.